Hi, it's Laura at Aquamarine 18, Tarot and Books. Thanks for stopping by my channel today. This is my end of month update for October 2022. Holy shit, it's almost 2023. I will be chatting about my general life updates, some news, I guess, or what I've been up to the last month anyway, some decks that I've received, the books that I've read, and what I've learned about my animal of the month. So I will, as always, timestamp below. I ramble. If you would like to skip some of the ramble, the timestamp is there so that you can do that. I talk for a long time. Anyway, uh, life updates for October. I think I shared in my last monthly update that I was looking forward to a root canal. My first root canal of my life, and that has now happened. I am still kind of in the process of this in that I have had the root canal, I have a temporary filling, I am now waiting a couple of more days for an appointment to have a permanent filling as well as a crown, which I don't know if that's one appointment or two or anything really about that process other than that it will be happening in a couple of days. I have my permanent filling to look forward to on October 31st, just in time for candy snacking. So that's how that's going. Um, the root canal was very long. Um, for folks who haven't had one before, I was in the chair for almost 90, like 90 minutes, I think, with my mouth wide open. Uh, that was uncomfortable. It was, though, pretty smooth. It was not painful. It has addressed the issues that I was having with the tooth, as far as I can tell, in terms of the tooth not causing pain or sensitivity in the ways that it was. It was long, but other than that, it was okay. Um, I did not end up using the pain prescriptions or anything like that that I was offered. I just didn't bother filling them at all. I was fine. Once the freezing came out, it was uncomfortable for a while, but not much. So I'm very happy to have that over with. I am always stressed about things like this. I have definite dental trauma in my history. And so any, like going to any new practitioner is really stressful. I have a dentist that I trust and I'm comfortable going to for things like fillings and cleanings, but this was scary. And I took the entire day off work from both of my jobs and I'm glad that I did. I was able to just come home and chill afterwards and recover, feeling pretty good. <clears throat> so I'm assuming that the permanent filling will be uneventful and that is all done. And I'm quite happy about that. That's my, that's my dental update of the month. <laughs> I'm glad that I don't necessarily have one of those every month, but since I mentioned it before, I figured I would update on that. Other than that, things have just been busy. Um, my work life is very busy. I definitely accepted one too many jobs this semester, I've mentioned before. Um, I'm looking forward to some of that um, weight being off in January. Uh, for now, I'm just trying to get things done as much as I can, being very busy. I've made a big change that I thought I would share in my personal practice and my tarot practice actually um, this month, which is that I have stopped doing daily draws. I have been doing a daily draw of sometimes a tarot, sometimes an oracle from last December, I think, up until now. And so, or, or shortly before now, a couple of days ago. And I've been keeping track of those daily draws in my day planner. And I've been having a bit of a morning routine of doing my sphere of protection ritual, which is part of Druidry practice for me. Um, it's like a shielding and balancing, um, energetic balancing kind of ritual. And then uh, drawing a card of the day and doing some journaling. And that's kind of been my morning routine for, for many months now. And daily draws were something that early on in learning tarot, I never stuck with. Could never stuck with, but this time I actually did for 
over, I think, 10 months. And I made the conscious decision to abandon it (laughs) this month. I have been finding that while it has been useful in terms of ensuring that I take a little bit of time every day for myself and to check in with myself and, you know, to just sit down and, and not be thinking about, you know, work and other kinds of demands on my time and to just kind of center and, and focus in the morning. That part has been useful, but the reading part, the, the card draw part of that, I think has not been as useful if I'm honest. And this is not a suggestion that daily draws are a bad practice or that people shouldn't do them. But what I found more and more was that I wasn't really, I don't want to say not getting anything out of it, but I wasn't spending enough time for myself um, with the cards that I was drawing because I'd be drawing a new one 24 hours later or a new, and, and sometimes it wasn't one. Sometimes it would be a two card reading or sometimes a three card reading. Usually it actually wasn't just one if it was tarot. It might be one if it was oracle. Anyway, I found I wasn't sitting with the readings as long as I wanted to. And so I have been feeling lately, and I think some of the work overwhelm is, is a big part of it, um, a desire to slow things down, a desire to um, just, you know, find a rhythm that feels less um, fast, really. So I've, I've made a shift to um, doing full moon and new moon readings, which I've been doing all along as well. Um, my daily draw was not the only tarot or oracle engagement that I was um, having, just eliminating that, focusing on the new and full moon readings and leaving those out on my reading table for the duration of the cycle, uh, pulling some extra cards at um, the moon phases in between. So um, waxing and waning crescent and and halfway through the cycle and so on. And journaling every day and still doing my sphere of protection every day, but not drawing a new card every single day. It was starting to feel too granular to do what I wanted it to do. And that's probably not very clear. Um, I'm still figuring out exactly what that practice of daily draw wasn't doing that I wanted it to do. And, and based on that, how to kind of exactly reconfigure things in a way that makes more sense for me in terms of what I want my daily practice to look like. So I very much still have a daily practice. It's just not drawing cards every day. And that's been good. I plan on making a tag uh, that folks can make VRs to if they would like to um, in the coming weeks. Um, But I'm not sure exactly what the tag is going to be yet, but I want, I mean, in terms of the actual, what goes after the, what I would call a pound sign (laughs) hashtag. I'm not exactly sure what that is going to be yet, but the idea is that I'm going to invite folks to make a VR about how they work with tarot or other divinatory tools in different time frames. So kind of like, what do you do daily? What do you do weekly? What do you do with moon phases? What do you do on New Year's once a year or on your birthday once a year and so on with obviously lots of flexibility for folks to redesign that VR in ways that make sense for them because there are lots of different calendars. Um, you know, people have different days of significance and commemorative times that they observe that, you know, we don't all observe the same ones. So I want it to be as inclusive and welcoming as possible, but I'm really curious. Um, and I don't think there's been a tag precisely about this. If there has been, please let me know and I'll make another years late VR, (laughs) um, like my tarot card max VR. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to, to hear how other folks navigate this and how, they make the decision to perhaps work with tools in particular kinds of ways in particular rhythms and particular kinds of um, frequency, I guess, in terms of daily or monthly or annually and so on. So that's going to be a tag that I'm going to make. I need a catchy name for it. I'll, I'll work on that. But um, looking forward to that. 
Other updates, um, I, I finally, finally, after much um, mulling it over, bought myself a new journal. <laughs> I've been using a um, journal for a number of months now. The journal company whose journal I was using, um, the paper is not as it once was. And I've been struggling with this because my ink has been just bleeding through the page. And I didn't want to waste the book, so I was using it until it made sense to get a new book, but I finally got a new book and I'm very happy about that. So this month I've had my first experience with Claire Fontaine paper and my uh, fellow pen nerds will probably know about Claire Fontaine paper. Um, so I got this notebook and it has, um, it has a table of contents at the beginning, which is useful. And then it is a dot matrix, plain dot matrix throughout with numbered pages and so I've been using this as my journal now. I really like Claire Fontaine paper I will say. Um, the one thing that I'm not thrilled about with this particular book is that um, the paper, I'm not sure how much you can tell from this lighting and on the camera, the paper is not white it's kind of yellow. I don't love that. I find that it makes the beautiful, vibrant fountain pen ink all kind of look a bit muddy. So not 100%, but I know Claire Fontaine makes white paper, so I'm going to go for that next um, and try a few others as well. But I really like the quality of the paper, I will say. That's a fun update. Other than that, what I've been up to this month that isn't work it feels like sometimes all that I'm up to is work. I'm currently taking a class with Kelly Fitzgerald of The Truth and Story. I've taken quite a few. Uh, and in this one, we are reading the novel Korag or the Highland Witch by Susan Fletcher. And we are looking at Kelly's Oracle of Place, which was designed kind of in um, with this book in mind. So that's been really great. It's a four week class, so four sessions. I've been through two. The third one is tomorrow. I'm really enjoying it. I always enjoy the classes. And I'm looking forward as well to Kelly's um, single session workshop that's coming up about animal guardians, um, which you can find on her website, thetruthandstory.com. I am really excited. So I've enjoyed spending my Sunday morning into afternoon uh, with folks talking about this wonderful novel, Korag. Um, which I will talk about in the book section of this video and looking at the Oracle of Place has been a lot of fun. That's been the highlight of my October so far. Next up, uh, and I'm rambling even more than usual, if that's even possible, uh, decks that I've received this month. I have received three decks this month, uh, one of which is a Kickstarter deck, which I backed some months ago now and two of which were wonderful gifts from, from friends. So I would like to share what those are. I just received, this is a Kickstarter deck, in the mail the other day, like two days ago, I think, uh, The Crystal Forests by Jess Purser. Um, this is a deck, I don't know if folks would be interested in a, in a walkthrough of this deck because it is a second edition. Um, so this deck has been around, I think, uh, previously, and the Crystal Forest, the back of the box, is it's a card deck to support and nurture personal growth using inspiration from the vibrant forests on the earth and the treasures found within. Uh, the treasures found within being crystals because they're paintings of forests inspired by different crystals. And it came with a guidebook and a postcard. And since I just got it, it's kind of in order. Um, these are the backs. The backs remind me a little bit of um, Le Terre Noir, the, the flower in the middle of the black background. And so this is a deck with different forests, again, um, inspired by crystals. And this one is Almondine Garnet. And if you can see, each card has the name of the stone and one keyword. And then the guidebook has a picture of the card and then a, a meaning there. So, and that's that's really it in the guidebook. There's a, 
a one page introduction um, a little bit about you know Jess had made a wisdom of the forest deck in 2019 and that kind of led to the creation of this deck so there's a kind of a one page explaining that backstory and then it goes right into the meanings I haven't spent too much time with the guidebook yet but um, you know druid <laughs> druid went for the tree deck um, I will blame my friend Patrice for this one Patrice this is your fault <laughs> Um, slash I credit you with this one. I shouldn't say blame. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring this deck. Certainly, you know, every card is an image of a forest. For some that might be repetitive. For a druid, I think it's quite exciting. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing readings with this. This, this feels like a one card draw for me. This feels like a keep one out on the table, um, maybe choose a card um, consciously, you know, based on the kind of um, energy you want to bring in and keep that card out on the table. That's how I would work with this deck. And I'm not buying crystals anymore for environmental and labor related reasons. Um, I just, you know, can't feel good about it at least not in in the vast majority of cases in the vast majority of contexts and so having something like this which is crystal inspired and is kind of structured around associations that different crystals have but that isn't made out of crystals itself appealed to me very much and I like the range of of color uh, palettes in here throughout the Kickstarter campaign there were some extras added um, based on uh, votes. I didn't really vote. Um, I don't ever really vote in these kinds of things, but different crystals were kind of put forward and folks could vote on which one they wanted to be another card in the deck. I don't remember even which ones were the additions and which ones were the ones that it started with, but I do think that this is a really cool deck in how the kind of ways that the different crystals look like this has been incorporated into the the paintings and the colors are amazing and the camera's not going to do justice but like this for labradorite is really colors that a lot of labradorite has and so i really really like this maybe i will do a full deck walkthrough of this deck we will see that is the crystal forests by jess purser and then i got two two lovely gifts and i haven't asked the friends if i should mention um, who sent me these so you know who you are um, much love um, for these lovely gifts and for your friendship um, a friend kindly sent me their copy of the druid craft tarot and it's trimmed and I as a druid have never owned the druid craft tarot so this is quite um, exciting to me it is a deck that um, I have looked at. I have uh, Will Worthington artwork decks in my collection. I have the animal, uh, the Druid Animal Oracle, which I'll pick an animal from in the end of this video. And I have the Wildwood Tarot, which I really like. But for some reason, I've never owned the Druid Craft Tarot. And folks have seen this deck um, for sure. Um, I'm thrilled that this copy that, that my friend sent me is trimmed because I think it looks um, so much better with the great big borders lopped off, if I'm honest. And I also think that this um, Hierophant looks like he's, um, he would be in a, in a metal band, I think. Um, I really like this and I love that it's trimmed because I would have wanted to trim it and if I trimmed it I would have made a mess <laughs> I haven't trimmed very many decks and when I have it's never um, looked very good <laughs> so I'm very happy to have a trimmed druid craft and I'm looking forward to exploring the druid um, I'm just flipping to show some miners the deck is still in order because it just arrived I'm looking forward to exploring the, the Druid-specific um, symbolism in this deck, certainly. 
And um, I know that this deck looks beautiful beside my Oum deck and Arboreal Oum. The colors look really great together. So that is a pairing that I will be exploring as well. I plan to edge the deck. Um, and I'm not sure, and you can tell me what you think below if you've edged your Druidcraft. Um, the backs are brown, but I'm kind of thinking green, but I'm kind of thinking brown. I'm not sure. I could alternate. I could do brown and green. I have some nice Tombow markers and a pack of Sharpies. I'm not sure exactly what this is going to be edged in, but it's going to be edged in something. And I'm excited about that. The other deck I received as a gift this month, um, it's a total surprise. I had no idea um, that this was coming, or I knew that it was coming, but I didn't know what it was. <laughs> Which, I am I get very um, much anticipation about surprises like that. Like, it was like, I don't want to say bugging me that I didn't know, but it's like, I don't, I want to know, you know? <laughs> I want to know what is coming. And I didn't know what was coming. I had very little hint. I had very little clue. I had very little, um, you know, description. I knew that a deck was coming and I had no idea what. And I knew that I didn't own it, but that was it. And my dear friend did a fabulous job picking a deck that I would love. And that is Great Lakes Tarot by David Wilson. And this deck, um, the creator also has made a, a Rust Belt deck which I had looked at and I had admired. Um, I have no ties to the Rust Belt in any um, immediate way and I never picked it up, but I liked the art style a lot. And now this, the Great Lakes Tarot, is like my um, first degree Druid study in a deck. I'm going to do a walkthrough of this deck with a full flip through. This this looks like where I live, these cards. Like this looks like the, you know, place where my friend's cottage is that we go sometimes. Flipping ahead a little bit. This looks like the tree that I took a photo of and made my Sol card in my um, Oum deck. I love this, I love this. I love these tulip lovers and dandelion for the chariot. I will do a full video of this. Um, I think that the choices, the frog's life cycle, it is really good. There is no book. Um, I will say that um, after spending a year and a bit reading tons of ecology books, focused on my uh, local ecosystem. I can identify a lot of the species in here um, just by, um, by sight. Which is interesting. I want to kind of figure out what the others are uh, that I don't know. Um, I'm going to make a video of this one, so I don't want to show too much here, um, but I will show um, that it's color, um, color coded in the minors. So the, um, the cups are fish. And it's a different, I think, it's a different fish species in each of the cards. And then the wands are flowers and plants. And are red, pink. Pink, really, more than red. The backs are, of course, the Great Lakes, if I didn't show that already. The air suit or swords are a mix of animals. So there's quite a few birds, but they're not exclusively. You can see that there's a moose there um, in the two of swords. Um, there's a heron. The heron was just voted the um, city's official bird where I live. And the snapper. My favorite miner has one of my favorite animals on it. The Six of Swords and the Loon. Another favorite buddy, the Otter, River Otter. Kingfisher. Kingfishers are really great because um, for folks who haven't encountered the Kingfisher, 
He'll chase you when you're canoeing or kayaking in a river. The kingfisher will follow you, which is fun. They're very bright um, green. So the swords have all different animals in them. Beautiful links. And then the pentacles are more so um, humans or kind of um, engagement with the the region of the Great Lakes. We'll see. So you have like camping and fishing and mushroom finding. I don't know things about mushrooms because I'm very allergic. Um, the five of pentacles, I think that this is algae bloom. Unless he's supposed to be frozen, but I think that it's an algae bloom in the Five of Pentacles, which makes sense. This is a this is definitely um, a provincial, or is it not provincial? But I guess a state park in Michigan. I've been I've been to that. There are some. Um, I've done that too. <laughs> a leap. Um, but there's definitely some that are um, places that I know, which is really interesting. Um, like this is, um, this is very definitely the Ambassador Bridge, uh, which is between Windsor, Ontario and Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my brother lived in Windsor for a number of years. Um, we've done lots of Detroit concert going together. And so there's the Ambassador Bridge as well as the, um, the tunnel as well. There's a lot of, um, wind turbines like this, like near where I grew up now. Um, this looks like it could be in the city that I grew up as well, which is on a river. Um, so this has been really cool to go through because these are all very familiar um, to me. I can't say that I can name every fish species just by looking at, um, but certainly some of them I can. Um, crappy is in here somewhere. Um, but I will make a full video of this one. I, I adore this deck. I'm very excited. And it's a really cool, like, it's cool. Like, it's a cool style. Um, and cool colors and I really love this and could not have had a better surprise so I appreciate this so much very excited I feel like this could be a bit of a study deck for me um, in some respects as well so that's the decks that I received this month and I've been exploring this month we're already at 27 minutes and now I get to talk about the nine books I've read we're in trouble <laughs> for this video um, so I read nine books this month. Before I talk about the nine books I read this month, um, I will mention that some of them are actually standalone short stories. I'll talk about those two, um, and, and mention that. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I guess, the, the fact that Goodreads, and I review books on Goodreads, and I review books on Storygraph as well. I like Storygraph better. But I, for the time being review on both. Um, Goodreads has been badgering me that I'm behind, behind in my reading. <laughs> and basically, for folks who aren't on there, what this means is that when you start the year or a little bit before the year begins in January, you set a number of books that you want to read in the coming year. And I've just always put a 100. And that's not because I have any real attachment to the number 100 or really want to read 100 books. It's just because when that feature was introduced in the first year that I used it, I had read 99 books the year before. So I figured, like, you know, why not aim for one more? It doesn't feel totally unreasonable. It's a nice, satisfying round number, you know. Why not? And so I've just put 100 every year since. And sometimes I've been, you know, a bit above that or, you know, but I'm, I'm always kind of around it. But for some reason, <laughs> for some reason, despite actually consciously not giving a fuck if I read 100 books or not, it has been bothering me. It's been bothering me that Goodreads has been badgering me for being multiple books behind. I'm two or three books behind now of the goal of reading 100 books by the end of the year. Consciously, I don't care. However, the fact that it keeps telling me that I'm behind has gotten to me. And so the part of the reason that I've read nine books this month is because I read two books that are actually standalone short stories. So they are books, but they're books of like 30 pages a piece. 
and several novellas because I'm like consciously subconsciously trying to catch up with a goal that I actually don't care about. And obviously I'm well aware that this is all part of a marketing scheme, right? Goodreads is owned by Amazon. It has all kinds of book selling functionalities built into it. I don't generally, I don't buy books off of Goodreads per se, but it, it you know, that is what it's for, right? Buy more books. I don't need any encouragement to tell me to buy more books. Everybody here knows that. But I felt a weird sense of pressure around that. So I've read nine books. Some of them are really short. They've gotten me to be less behind <laughs> in my count. <laughs> so there it is. I've had a good reading month though, and I've read some interesting ones. So I will tell you about those. I don't have anything physical to show you because I've read them all on Kindle, but here we go. I read a short novel or novella. I think it's probably a novel. Servant Mage by Kate Elliott. This is a fantasy novel following a protagonist on an adventure in a world where there are these different mages who have different kinds of powers that are kind of elementally based. So there are water mages and fire mages and they can do different things based on that affiliation. There's an aspect of kind of parallel worlds and like a kind of magical world and a mundane world layered on top of each other. And in this book, the mages are not treated very well. Um, not everybody is a mage and not everybody has magical powers in, in this world. Um, it's, it's one that has been on my list for quite a while since I knew it was coming out. It's, you know, I'm, I like reading fantasy and I like novellas. I liked it. Um, I will say what I didn't like about Servant Mage uh, was that I found the protagonist extraordinarily irritating. <laughs> Um, I don't have to like a protagonist. In fact, I, I can frequently be a fan of books where really nobody is very likable. I don't need somebody to be straightforwardly likable as a main character, not by a long shot. But I found this character annoying. <laughs> and so that bugged me. Um, and they were the only character that you really got to know very well in this like fairly short novel. So that irked me. I liked the world. I liked the magic system. I would read something else set in this world. Perhaps it needed a bit more space in terms of the length of the book, but I liked it overall. I read Spear by Nicola Griffith. I adored Spear by Nicola Griffith. Um, I love this book. This is a queer, feminist, woman-centering retelling of a Knights of the Round Table adjacent story. Um, I don't think I could say too much more about it beyond that, um, other than that Spear in the title is referring to one of the four treasures. Um, and this was beautiful. I loved it. I loved Spear. If you are interested in uh, mythology, or Arthurian kind of mythology, uh, I would suggest that it would be very much worth reading. It's a short book as well. Um, really, really, really good. I loved it. I read Coreg by Susan Fletcher, um, which I mentioned. Coreg is also called The Highland Witch in some publications. There's just a couple of different editions. The text does change a little bit between them. Um, and some editions have an interview with the author in it and some of them don't. The one that I got didn't, unfortunately. And we were reading this as part of Kelly Fitzgerald's uh, Tales class. It's the novel that inspired her Oracle of Place. And I read it faster than the class demanded. It, it, it's a four week class, so it was kind of dividing the novel up into four chunks, but most people had read it before because it's a bit of a revisit for a lot of people, but I had never read it before. And I loved it. It's a novel about um, young, young, woman, girl really, um, Coreg, who was a witness to and is um, remembered as having saved people in the context of the Glencoe Massacre. So it is a historical fiction 
uh, most of or all of really the main characters in the book are based on real people. Um, obviously, some of those people's lives are better documented than others, and there are definitely aspects of the story that are fictionalized. But the author, um, Susan Fletcher, talks about in an afterward precisely how she did that. And so, for example, part of the book, uh, Korag is incarcerated and is waiting for um, the time to come when she's going to be burned as a witch. And her apparent time being incarcerated or her being incarcerated at all, frankly, um, is not based in historical um, account of her life. But those parts of the novel are based in what we do know historically about uh, prisons and about witch trials at that time period. So it's historically informed. Um, I thought that this novel would have been better if the romance aspect was completely left out. It was not necessary. Not every book needs a romance. But other than that, this was fantastic. And I would absolutely recommend it for folks who are uh, interested in any kind of historical fiction at all. Korag by Susan Fletcher was uh, fantastic. And I can see why it is well loved and why it has now been the subject of multiple truth and story classes. It's great. Um, next, I'll talk, I'll talk about two together. Um, two books that I read are actually standalone short stories. These are short stories that from my understanding, and somebody can tell me if, tell me if I'm wrong, um, these are short stories that are only available as Kindle eBooks. That are not published anywhere else and that there are a couple of these kind of different series of standalone short stories that are available kind of very very inexpensively or free um, if you have kindle unlimited to read on a um, an e-reader so i'd read one of these before um, nk jemison wrote one emergency skin and so i read two of those this month I read These Alien Skies by C.T. Ruizzi, and I read Clap Back by Nalo Hopkinson. And These Alien Skies is about um, a pair of um, captains, I'm sure, or ship, yeah, pilots, I guess, um, who are going to a world that is going to be populated by humans but isn't yet. And I'll just leave it at that. It's a short story. It's hard to talk about without just spoiling the whole thing if you say anything more than the basic premise. And Clap Back by Nayla Hopkinson is about a... Um, again, don't want to give too much away. Um, is, a, is a kind of about a performance art show that has some fantastical elements. Um, and there's a kind of, um, there's a definitely strong kind of analysis in this story because the, the performance art piece has to do with a commentary on racist memorabilia, very multi-layered, brilliant. Um, I'd read Nayla Hopkinson before, C.T. Ruizzi was new to me. Um, both of these short stories were really good. Um, and there's more in the series and there are several of these different series of these standalone short stories. And I know um, Victor Laval has done one. Um, there's a couple of other authors who I've read before um, who've done these uh, short stories. Andy Weir, I think, did one. So I'm going to be looking at more of these. Um, I enjoyed both of these ones very much, and I'm, I'm less behind <laughs> on my book goal <laughs> because I read books that were 30 pages long. These were both absolutely worth a read. I will read more from both authors on the basis of those. I read Mammoth by Chris Flynn. Um, this is like nothing else I've ever read. And Mammoth was a pick for my friend, Katie Bellew, Katie Flowers book club on Patreon. And we vote on the books and whichever one wins is kind of the next book that we read. And Mammoth is a very fictionalized, but partially historical book that is told from the perspective of a bunch of fossils who are waiting to be auctioned off. So the main storyteller is a fossilized mammoth, hence the title mammoth. But mammoth is in a room in this kind of auction house with several other um, skeletons of different dinosaurs and um, a 
taxidermied penguin. And there's, there's these different characters who are all kind of talking to each other and recounting these stories of how they were exhumed or, or discovered or dug up and how they came to be in this auction house. <laughs> and so there are aspects of this that are historically grounded, certainly, um, that are very interesting, actually, um, around kind of the politics of archaeology and the, and the sale of, of dinosaur remains and things like this that are, that are quite interesting. And then there are other kind of long sections that are completely fictionalized with characters that did not exist, but are based in kind of real historical contexts, but that the individuals did not exist. All with this kind of framing device of fossils having a chat. And they're very funny. Like they're, I could imagine the kind of banter of these fossils in a kind of, the kind of Disney film where the jokes are really for the parents, but the kids think it's fun because it's talking fossils. Like that, that is what this book felt like to me. I struggled with the ebook because the ebook was missing a lot of punctuation, specifically quotation marks. It was hard to tell who was talking about what. I am told by my friend Thea, who was also in the book club, that the audiobook was really, really good. And that does not surprise me at all. I just don't do audiobooks. But this was fun. It was fun and it was different and unlike anything I had ever read before. And I'm glad that we picked it. That was Mammoth by Chris Flynn. I read Feed Them Silence by Lee Mandelo. This is not out yet. This is a advanced reader copy. Thank you, publisher. Um, I had never read Lee Mandelo before. Um, they do have some other books I know um, published, but Feed Them Silence is about a neuroscientist, I guess, who is part of a research study in which they are interfacing with a wolf. So they are kind of, for lack of better language, hooked up to a wolf such that the wolf is ostensibly anyway unaware of what's going on, but the human who is kind of plugged in with them can experience what the wolf is experiencing. And so experiences these different kind of sensory experiences that humans just don't have. Like when you think about um, like the scent capabilities of, of other animals that humans don't have, for example, um, this researcher is experiencing this in real time. And this is, this is a creepy, this is a creepy book. Um, and it was creepy because it went to creepy, disturbing, definitely real life places in terms of, um, animal research ethics and funding and, um, you know, exploitation of research subjects, quite frankly, um, as well, the experience of interfacing with the wolf obviously has profound effects on the researcher and the researcher's relationships and, and there was a lot. There was a lot in this quite short, it wasn't a, quite a novella, but a, a short novel. I think that Lee Mandela was a really good writer based on this. Um, I wish that the secondary characters were more developed because it was very much about the main researcher. Not at all a likable character, but so well written, I thought. Very creepy. So let's feed them silence. I thought that was good. I read Elder Race by um, Adrian Tchaikovsky. I have been reading a few Adrian Tchaikovsky um, just in the last year or so. And I've liked all of them, actually, uh, which is fun. Elder Race is a short novel about a um, pair of characters, uh, one of whom is the fourth daughter of royalty, who's kind of out to try to prove herself by vanquishing a demon in the in the lands you know, it's a fantasy aspect and then the other character is the wizard on the hill who she enlists to help her in this quest and you learn very very early on in the book so this is not really a spoiler that the wizard is in fact a anthropologist from another planet right who is not exactly a wizard <laughs> And the book kind of alternates between the two of them's perspectives. And there's one chapter where the two of them's perspectives are combined and you've got kind of two columns going down the page and it was so well done. And I'm very into this. 
And it was really good. I will say with Elder Race that the psychological torment experienced by the wizard slash anthropologist character being kind of on his own on this planet was way more interesting than the demon hunting kind of plot. The, this was totally a character driven story. I really enjoyed it. I have, I, I thought that it was a really, really good, um, you know, when people abbreviate like SFF, like sci-fi fantasy, this was exactly that. Like it was, sim it was absolutely both in ways that I thought were really well done. I think Adrian Tchaikovsky is really good. Um, I, I don't remember the what the first book was that I read of his or why I picked it up. I know my mom has read a couple of his books and and liked them. Um, I do mostly like I will just say like I will just name that I read um, mostly books read by written by women and non-binary folks and queer folks like just overwhelmingly so I would say. Um, but I really like his work. I really like it. Um, and I'm going to read more. And so I really liked Elder Race. I really like, um, kind of anthropologist exploration in science fiction. Ursula Le Guin does this really well, obviously. Um, there are some other authors who have, who've explored this as well. And I thought Elder Race was really good. So definitely thumbs up for that one. Finally, I read a very, very highly anticipated, so highly anticipated, in fact, that I had pre-ordered it and then I forgot. And then when it appeared on my e-reader, I forgot that I had bought it. And I thought that like one of my family members who shares my um, Kindle account might have put something on my credit card by accident, but it was a pre-order that I had done and I had forgotten about. Um, Into the Riverlands by Nevo. And this is the third book in the Singing Hills cycle of novellas. And I adore this series. And there are going to be more. I believe there are going to be three more, which makes me very happy. Um, Into the Riverlands and the two books that precede it follow Chi, and Chi is a monk. And they're a monk that travels with Almost Brilliant. Almost Brilliant is a bird who speaks and has a perfect memory. And they travel gathering and hearing stories. And this one, I just, I love this series. I love this series very much. And Into the Riverlands, I would say more, even more so than the other two, very um, like wuxia kind of historical callback um, with the kind of different styles of martial masters and, you know, traveling on the road and, and getting into these kind of epic um, martial arts battles with these different groups and it so so good I love this series so if you haven't read Nevo's Singing Hell Cycle pick up the first one don't start with the third one because they do kind of follow right on you know one to the next you could read them as standalones but definitely read the whole series loved it I just been I read it in one day I loved it so that's all the books that I've read this month all nine of them I'm still um, two books behind. <laughs> I'm two books behind the arbitrary goal of 100 books of the year. Will I make the goal? Who knows? Do I really care that much? No. But I do at the same time. And I think that that's ridiculous, but also kind of fun. So we'll see. Animal of the month. My animal of the month was salmon. This is from the Druid Wisdom Oracle, or sorry, Druid Animal Oracle, not Druid Wisdom Oracle, that's a different deck. Druid Animal Oracle um, by Philip Cargom, and the art is um, Will Worthington. And you can see the beautiful salmon here in the sacred pool. And you can see the hazelnut up here, which is going to give you a hint of where I'm going to go um, with what I'm going to say about this salmon. They also have um, the Oum here um, on the corner. I don't know if you can see here. Yep, for Nyetal, broom. Oh, not broom. Um, Nyetal is uh, reed. The Oum for reed is there. Um, but hazel, hazelnuts are also um, call in the Oum. And I was excited when salmon got picked as the, um, as the animal of the month because salmon are really... Um, 
special and important in Druidry. Uh, salmon have a lot of um, importance in some different mythologies that I thought that I would talk a little bit about. Um, and because of their place in those mythologies, they're associated with uh, wisdom. And um, I will say the association of um, wisdom being something that comes to you when you're not chasing it, and also wisdom um, sometimes being associated with a lack of experience, like the wisdom of kind of um, not having too much experience. And that comes from, I think, um, Finn McCool, especially, especially in Finn McCool's uh, story, there is a salmon, there's called the Salmon of Wisdom, and I think this is the Salmon of Wisdom. And the reason that the salmon is wise in these stories is because they eat the hazelnuts, which you can see there. Um, and hazelnut is associated with wisdom in the oem. And so the salmon eat the hazelnut of wisdom, and, and when a human would eat the salmon, they would gain wisdom and enlightenment. And so Finn is... Um, so the story goes, this is a very truncated version of the story, to be clear, um, is studying under a, um, a poet, a bard, who for years and years and years is trying to catch um, one of these salmon to be able to eat the salmon uh, of wisdom and gain the wisdom of, of the world right? and gain all knowledge. And he finally catches it and he gives it to young Finn to cook the salmon, but definitely not eat any of the salmon, right? Because someone is going to gain all, all knowledge here, right? And the, the poet wants it to be himself. And so Finn um, is cooking the salmon and burns himself while he's cooking it and instinctively puts um, his thumb in his mouth, which he's scalded, and in doing so gains all the wisdom um, of eating the salmon of wisdom. And there's a very similar, um, there's a very similar story to this one um, in Welsh context of Taliesin the bard and Taliesin um, as a young a young boy uh, stirring and maintaining the the cauldron of inspiration of Caradwen and not being supposed to consume anything from the cauldron which is actually for Caradwen's son and then Taliesin um, burning himself um, and again putting his his finger in his mouth or his thumb in his mouth and gaining all wisdom in in the process and um, so the salmon is associated with this kind of wisdom in both of these, and also in, um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Kolach and Olwen, which is the oldest um, Welsh Arthurian story. And in that story, the, the group um, of adventurers meet this, you know, there's like a lot of things that happen in this um, story, but meet all of these animals, a series of animals who are the oldest animals. And they go from kind of an animal to then an older animal, like an older and wiser animal, right? As they go along, looking for Mabon, the, the child. And the salmon is the oldest and the wisest, who's able to help them um, get where they're trying to go um, in this story. So salmon, you know, in, in being ancient is associated with wisdom, but then also the ones in the stories who end up eating the salmon of wisdom and gaining wisdom as a result are, are young um, and are kind of inexperienced at the time of that happening for both um, Finn McCool and, and Taliesin. So salmon is associated very strongly with wisdom and that is why also in the Awam that call or hazel, which is associated, I put my keywords are wisdom, insight, knowledge, and illumination. That relates also directly to this because of this, you know, it's because of the hazelnuts um, the nine, the nine hazel trees that grow around the sacred pool um, and the hazelnuts falling in and then the salmon eating the hazelnuts that, that this wisdom of the salmon exists. And the salmon, um, not the salmon of wisdom specifically, but kind of salmon as, as an animal, um, is interesting, I think, because um, salmon are known to be able to return to the very precise place that they uh, were spawned to be able to, uh, you know, lay their eggs and, and reproduce themselves. So there is this kind of sense of, like, deep wisdom from um, the moment of being born, right, that I think is interesting in the way that it shows up in those stories. So that is salmon. And what a, what an animal to learn 
so much about in terms of um, myth that is directly related to, to Druidry specifically. So that's the salmon. I am going to pick the next animal. This deck is getting smaller and smaller um, <laughs> because I do take out a couple of cards. As I've mentioned before, there's um, like dragons and stuff in this deck that I don't include. I don't think of dragons in the same way as learning about an animal of the month. And also I'm taking out the ones I've already had. So finding an animal for November. And I don't know, I don't know if animal of the month is something I'm going to do through 2023 exactly. We will find out. Like, I don't know if I'm going to keep doing that in these videos or if I'm going to put in something else of the month. I'd, I'm not sure. We'll see. Certainly, I'm always going to be learning about and exploring animals in my practice. That's not that's not going anywhere. But the animal for November will be... Oh, fox. Fox. That's a good one, too. There are lots of foxes where I live. We see them not infrequently. I have lots of things I could say about fox already, but I'm going to save them. I'm going to save them for next month. I have now blathered on for 56 minutes. <laughs> I hope you watch this on double speed. <laughs> so that's my October. I hope you've had a lovely October. Tell me about your October in the comments below. Um, it's October 29th today, so the month is almost over. Um, I don't have too much else planned for the rest of October, except that I will certainly be wearing my Star Trek captain outfit to work on Monday, on the 31st. That is my plan for rounding out October. I wish everybody a happy October, happy November, happy beginning of November, happy Halloween. Happy Samhain if I don't see you between now and then. All the best. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again soon.